Lewis, thank you so much uh, for agreeing to talk to me. Um, fascinating story. Uh, Pionarco is quite an amazing book. Um, it's rare that you get someone who has been involved in the narcotics trade, the illegal narcotics trade, to talk so openly about their lives and their lifestyles. And also, you know, I, I do get that you are 100% genuine. Um, and there are so many things that gives me, um, gives me that belief when you read the book. I mean, you went to, you, you know, you come from a pretty privileged background in Cuba. I take it, uh, once a revolution happened, you left. Yes. Um, it has to do a lot with uh, who you are, your personality. I mean, I went to very good schools and there were people that I went to school with that they wanted to be a doctor. They wanted to be an engineer or an architect. All I knew was that I wanted to be involved in business and uh, make money. But my thing was, I wasn't going to be a lawyer or an architect or anything like that. I just, I was an entrepreneur. I had that spirit. And I wasn't totally defined. And, you know, I was working at New England Mutual and then at the radio station. And uh, suddenly I meet this girl. And, um, you know, we fall in, in love and lust. And she's involved in the business. And I said, wow, this is an amazing business. This is like um, great. Also, the way I got in was with an amazing girl at a very high level. So you know, the first time I ever saw any kind of money, it was like six and a half million dollars. She was dealing at a very high level and I was part of that. And, you know, everything you know, the planets were aligned. I said, this is a fantastic business. L Lewis, let's, let's go back. I mean, you had, you went to Georgetown University. You had a little bit of an experience there. You were selling a little bit of weed, maybe a little bit of cocaine. So how did you meet, how did you meet this girl? Um, there was a, I was working at a radio station and, you know, we, we did some kind of fraudulent uh, thing with the rating books and so on and so forth. And, uh, the FCC found out about it and I got a little concerned and I said, the FCC is going to come after me. So I left to Ecuador. I spent three months in Ecuador and I came back to Miami and my girlfriend gives me a birthday party. I was sitting in a chair, you know, having a scotch and in through the door comes this beautiful knockout exotic girl. I go, Whoa, she is definitely not a local. She, she's got that flair, the looks, she came with somebody else, but we look at each other and there's constant, you know, energy right there, constant bond. I mean, boom, we started talking. Maybe we spoke for 45 minutes and we, we, we look at each other and say, what are we doing here? Let's leave. And she says, let's go. We hopped in her car. She left her date. I left my date. It was my birthday party. When the time came out to blow out the candles, Lewis was nowhere to be found. This guy must have been looking around, looking for his girlfriend, nowhere to be found. We end up at her place on Brickle, uh, Brickle Place. And we go for, you know, a two day tremendous, you know, party between her and me. And we had a great time. And really, uh, it was amazing because I had never been with such a exotic, sensual woman. And, uh, kind of changed my outlook on what all that was <laughs> she took me in in a big way and then she says listen um you mind coming with me to san francisco and i go well you, you know i got a job i'm, I'm an insurance salesman I says well can't you take three days off tell me you're gonna go sell a policy somewhere in san francisco i go well i guess so you know we're heading to the airport and then i said well this isn't the way to the airport well sure sure enough we were heading to Palm Beach to the uh, private airport and we took a Learjet to San Francisco. I mean, I go, well, you know, uh, wow, this is amazing. It's maybe like uh, a young man's dream to meet an older woman that teaches him uh, the, the tricks of the trade and uh, is, is just everything on a silver platter. It was, you know, the best of everything at all times, the best restaurant. We'd go to a restaurant in San Francisco you know, spend $2,000, like nothing, $3,000, Chateau Lafitte, Chateau Brion, Champagne, you know, Armagnac, after whatever. 
crazy. How old were you at this point? 23, uh, let's see. No, 79. Yeah, 23, maybe going on 24, 23. I mean, amazing, amazing experience. <laughs> and uh, she said it was emeralds, you know, that her business was emeralds. Green stones, not white powder. Yeah, no, because I, I did see some of the uh, round football style things, and she said, no, it, it's because it's raw emeralds. They're not the little, these are the raw emeralds, and from these pieces, they take the little, yeah, they, that sounds good to me. Then she finally admitted, you know, you know, over a nice sunset scene over the Golden Gate Bridge, and she said, listen, uh, it's uh, what I, it's cocaine. And I go, wow, that's far out. Uh, I mean, and I started thinking, you know, like uh, when the Beatles came out, their music, you know, great music. What really impressed me about the Beatles is here are these 17, 18, 20 year old kids making millions of dollars. That's what I was most impressed about. The music hit me secondary, but I was really primarily impressed with young kids making millions of dollars. It was unheard of. This is, and you know, that's always caught my uh, imagination, for example. So what I told her was, you know, I've always wanted to be a rock and roll star and I think this is better than rock and roll. So yeah, I'm in, let's, let's do it. So I, you know, helped her out and I was with her for about a year and then we broke up. And during that year, you know, I met all those great connections she had out West, which was key. That was very important because uh, back then, Miami was a nut house. And back then, five kilos in Miami was a big deal. But you were dealing with a lot of, you know, delinquent types. And she was dealing with some really clean cut American smugglers that were smuggling from the 70s, the hash from uh, Asia and uh, in Lebanon also. And these were really honest, clean cut hash dealers that while they were waiting for a trip that could take nine months, they decided to invest some money in cocaine and why not? And, you know, they started buying hundreds of kilos at a time, unheard of. She was like the goose that laid the golden. What year was this? 79, where that, you know, that stuff was going for 65,000 a kilo. You know, for Medellin, she was a golden girl for the Medellin cartel. They were having trouble in Miami over five kilos and 10 kilos and dealing with, you know, Cubans down here that were fighting it out with the Colombians. And here we hook up with these gringos that are just as honest as they come. They give you all the money in hundreds, beautifully stacked, nothing's missing, and it's constant. So this was an amazing thing that I fell into. It was less Scarface and more like dealing, dealing with Ford or dealing with Chrysler. On a handshake. These marijuana hash people were not your crazy cocaine cowboys that were happening down in Miami. These were gentlemen, great, really cool people, nonviolent, but they just happened to be in that market for so many years that you know, to them moving this, they had, they were the original smugglers, the original big time, uh, very smart, logistical minded people to plan a trip of Thai stick from Thailand or, you know, um, they used to use research vessels. They used to invest a lot of money in equipment. Very, very uh, interesting people, the way they worked. And uh, I was always very intrigued of their style and professionalism so did you did you start freelancing when you split up with this lady how what happened Who no no involved? you know she um she knew i was going to she didn't want me to continue after i broke up with her because she knew how bad this business was and she thought well this kid's going to end up in miami selling two kilos and he's going to get killed so she says well if you're in you know you insist on staying you might as well stay with my people under their umbrella, under their wings. So she left me in the hands of Poli, which is a very, very serious person <laughs> and very feared, to say the least. 
Um, and she knew that Polly would take care of me. And uh, I had a certain affinity with Polly. So she figured if he's going to stay in the business, might as well stay with Polly and continue working with Brian out West. That's a clean deal. I don't want him dealing two kilos in Miami and getting killed by some Cubans or whatever. And nobody messed with Polly. Polly was a very, very, uh, had a very vicious reputation and was very respected even from Medellin. But he wasn't working for the Medellin cartel, or was he? He was an independent, but he was with Medellin. He was from Medellin, and his main partner was Jose Pepe Sarmiento, El Viejo Pepe, who was a huge player for Pablo and the Medellin cartel. And Poli is an old-time bandido. He was a badass before cocaine became popular. They call him Poli because he killed so many policemen in Colombia. You know, he was a very deadly serious person. But it is a deadly serious business. But you never carried a gun, did you? Never. Never. I never was interested in guns. I didn't know about guns. And when I saw people that really carried guns and used guns, I said, you know, I, I'm no match for people that really know how to use a gun. Why should I use a gun? You know, so I always came across as nonviolent, no guns. And that was not part of my, you know, facade. I didn't want to be associated with that. Now, people around me were very good at using guns. So, but I figured if a gun battle broke out, I was not going to make the difference because I didn't know how to use those things. So. What about, what about the violence attached to it? You, you know better than most that, that with all kinds of anything that's illegal, people have to protect it from other people taking them down. And they use violence, intimidation, fear to, to, to hurt people. Um, you, you witnessed that? You must have witnessed it firsthand. Yes. Um, people make mistakes, you know. The, you know, these people that give you 100 kilos, 200 kilos, 5 kilos, 3 kilos. I've never, most of these people have a reputation of being violent. So most cases that I've seen is, you know, people go up to them and think they can take them for a ride. And it's an insult to go ask somebody that you know has a violent side. You know, and they give you something and you take it from them. You know, here in this business, you steal, you die. But it's not like they tell you, no, we're, we're cool people. You know, we're cool. We won't kill you. No, they tell you right up front. You take our shit. You don't pay us. You're going to die. And people, and people have died. Thousands yeah. and thousands and thousands. And people continue to, to think they can outsmart other people. And that's big mistakes, you know. There's nothing like the truth. I've lost merchandise, but I'm truthful about it. And I prove it. Listen, this wasn't stolen. This was lost. Boom. And I've always, you know, faced up to it. And um, I have to admit that the start, you know, I started um, distribution in California. So I had a very good reputation. People knew I had excellent clients that paid. So I was very fortunate to create uh, a lot of goodwill in that business and you know um people always was you know the colombian side they were offering me always uh, major amounts of merchandise for me to move because they knew i had good outlets was it simply you getting on a plane with blocks kilo blocks of cocaine in miami flying to san francisco or to wherever in california going to a hotel opening up the suitcase handing over five blocks and getting millions of dollars back. It worked. Well, we, we did do that. We did on and off take 12 or 15 kilos that would you know, be left over of you know, certain batches because uh, we didn't want to sell them in Miami. We always sold them securely in San Francisco. And back then you put them in a suitcase or you put them in your handbag and you fly to San Francisco. I just hand over the bag. But most of the merchandise was being transported in uh, trucks or cars 
with hidden compartments and we'd send 100, 120 at a time. 120 kilos? Yes, back then, which was a lot, at 65. We would be doing this constantly and after a while, I had three or four clients buying 120 kilos a month. That's a lot of merchandise uh -huh. back then. That, that's also a heck of a lot of cash. Louis. Well, I, at times I had, you know, 500 kilos out, out there. What did you do with the cash? What, what, what did you do with well, the Well, most of it belonged to Colombia. Most, most of it be, belonged to the owners of the merchandise. I charged, you know, uh, a difference in price, three, $4,000 a kilo, uh, which was mine. But the bulk of the money went back to Colombia. And then it got to a point that I couldn't deal with it anymore. I couldn't deal with, you know, millions and millions of dollars out West and having to bring it back to Miami. I had to buy cars to transport the money at all times. And then the Colombians set up a banking system for me out West where I used to just deliver them the money to their bankers out West and alleviate. I said, I can't do both. Either I'm selling, but this business of taking the money back to Miami, it's, it's a full-time situation here. And I don't want to be responsible for, you know, 15 million, you know, in a car or, or two cars. You know, we wouldn't put more than five or six million in each car. But suddenly you have, you know, three, four, five cars heading back. And it's, you know, it's stressful. <laughs> But how stressful was it? And what did you do to release the stress? Oh, uh, I was, I drank, I partied. We, we were, we, we were a, a party mo uh, a party group. I mean, um, I guess that's what I did to release the stress, drink and party. I mean, I never went uh, mountain climbing and I, I never, you know, release the adrenaline any other way. My business was enough adrenaline. And back then, uh, I always wanted to keep a low profile because it's very dangerous. You know, people know that you're moving that much weight. People get weird ideas, kidnap this guy. But then again, if you kidnap me, then okay, you're, you kidnap me, you end up kidnapping a liability because I'm a guy that now owes 10 million to the Medellin cartel and you kidnap me. Well, they're going to charge you the 10 million. So, but still, I always kept a very low profile and I didn't ever look that much like a criminal and just kept away from. But, but in terms of the partying, did you ever get high on your own supply? Yes, yes. For many years, you know, I was, you know, hooked on that. Uh, I never snorted, never, never snorted if I didn't have a drink. It was always, you start drinking and then you want to snort. I've never snorted without drinking. Alcohol was the, uh, the initiator. You start drinking and you want, and then drinking and snorting is a good combination. You know, uh, you can go on for days. So alcohol is a bad one. Cocaine is a bad one. They're all bad. Pot is a very mellow situation. I smoked pot early on, but then I stopped. Once I started drinking and snorting, I never smoked, uh, smoked pot again. Um, I don't recommend that to anybody. You're still here, though, Lewis. You're still here. I'm still here. It's amazing that I'm here. I, I, I don't know. I, like I said, I don't know. I really don't know. I was just a very fortunate person. and. The planets must have been aligned for a very long time. 25 years is a long time. It's not what I did. It's how long I did it for. Yeah, not many people do it for that long and live. Did you lose friends? Oh, yes. Yes. I lost friends in Colombia. I lost a very good friend here in Miami. You know, he used to work for the Italian mafia. and His own people killed him and, you know, put him in a cement drum and dumped his the drum with his body in it in the canal in Hialeah. It was discovered later. And he was a very close friend of mine. It's in the book. 
And um, so I, I've lost friends. Yes. Was there a constant fear inside of you that it could go wrong at any minute? You could be shot in the back of the head or arrested? You know, uh, shot in the back of the head? No, because I felt secure with the people I was with. And, and believe me, I, I dealt with some real crazies. But somehow the other, you know, I always had a knack for these crazies and they liked me. And there was, there was always a a bond with these ultra crazies. I don't know why. Maybe they thought I was crazier than, than they were. They said, this guy must be coming here to ask me for 5,000 kilos. This guy must be out of his mind. And he doesn't carry a gun and he's got a great reputation to, to making it. He, he doesn't lose many loads. And that's why, you know, they, they talk to you and they take you in. But uh, um, being shot in the back of the head, no. The law... You're always, you know, you're always moving around to avoid. I always changed departments. I always changed names. I never told anybody where I live. Um, yeah, I was always cautious of the law, so I, I took certain precautions. Even today, I don't tell people where I live, and you know, my my true address does not appear on my driver's license. For example, uh, I don't. I don't have a phone at home, you know. Um, even today, I can't go to sleep knowing that you know some idiot knows where I live. But you've got family, haven't you? Yes, I do. I mean, and 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 one of the things you say is is that you sort of kept it from them, but once you decide having a family, you should have got out of the business there and then. Without a doubt, that's my biggest mistake, and that's a very big act of irresponsibility on my part. Then again, I never, I wasn't, I didn't have time to think about all these things. I was so busy working and it was my business. I had no intentions of ever getting out because I didn't ever think I would get caught. So, but looking back, I should have just quit the day I had my daughter. Done it because that's a very, dangerous thing to be in and having family i felt secure in what i was doing because the, because of the protection that you had from the cartel yes yes i felt very secure because the level we were working at you know it was you know the system was already in place it, it was like thousands of kilos sometimes i saw the kilos sometimes i didn't because i owned my own airplanes Sometimes I like to go to the landing strips and see the load up and make sure and talk to the pilot before he leaves or something like that. But this was just like clockwork. It was a system that was established and it was just, you know, constantly airplanes going to Mexico, um, airdrops into the Bahamas, you know, later on boats going to Jamaica, um, boats going to Central America. In the end, it was freighters. In the end, it was freighters. Yeah, freighters going to Europe. So, I mean, I went from distribution to then going and setting up offices in Colombia, which were export offices. And at any given time, I'd have six or seven good routes that we were feeding. So at any moment, we had six, seven, 8,000 kilos in movement. I was in Belize at a certain point and they were calling them, uh, I think they were calling the billionaire fishermen because at one point, one of the cartels was sending 10 big ribs, like with like five big outboard motors on it with a hundred keys on and it could, could afford to, ten, to send 10 boats with a hundred keys on each, knowing that if one got through, that was enough to make them a profit. We worked a lot in Belize, but we would always send um, a thousand, eight, eight hundred, a thousand, two hundred. We would send a thousand, six hundred on a boat to Cancun constantly. We used to airdrop off Cozumel. I worked a lot in Belize, a lot. I'm very familiar with Belize. We we used to land planes in uh in the uh, my in the western part, northwestern part of Belize, and um, 
then that merchandise would go go to Mexico and eventually to the U.S. But worked a lot in Belize. Moved 20, 30,000 kilos easily in, through Belize, if not more. You traveled to all these countries. Did you not raise the suspicion? Were you not? Did you just not start raising a suspicion with the DEA and others? Well, I traveled with different names and, you know, I, I moved in, in a way that, you know, uh, I think it was secure because I, I never got arrested. You know, I had an incident in Mexico once coming from Cuba with my Mexican passport because uh, the guy that usually received me wasn't there, but I always liked um, being hands-on to a certain point, you know, and that went a long way with the people that I worked with, because at least they could say, you know, if there was a problem, I was there. You know, I always liked to, you know, give them that security that I was going to be there. And there were problems and, you know, they got fixed and I participated in making sure they got fixed. What about then, what about Lewis, about the people at the very bottom? I mean, I've been uh, into Peru, for instance, where I think you made about, I don't know, I would say nearly a, a million dollars worth of paste there, which by the time it's stamped on and it ends up in Washington, could have been worth 50 million. I don't know. But it was a, a lot of paste, cocaine paste, you know, uh, a, a lot. Uh, um, but those people... They were earning $10 a week, $10. It's very sad. It's very sad. And um, they're earning $10 a week and probably they'd be earning $0 a week if they weren't involved in that. But it's very sad because that's part of the reason I said we should legalize this shit, make it fair trade. And if a kilo is sold for 50000 somewhere, a chunk of that should go to the poor people. I mean, that's way down the line, but it's very sad, you know, the collateral damage, the abuse, the human abuse, the human addiction, the abuse to the ecosystem. And once you legalize it, you start putting checks into all this chaos that's going on. But the poor people at the bottom, there's a lot of abuse. You know it. You've been there. But also, I mean, people often forget that FARC uh, paid for their war through the sale of cocaine, right? Oh, my God. Um, one of the worst presidents of Colombia, Andres Pastrana, gave the FARC like 42,000 square kilometers in the middle of nowhere. And it was a demilitarized de zone. All they did for I don't know how many years is cook cocaine. I think there's, there must still be some of that coke being exported. The FARC financed their whole operation with cocaine. They are, prob they are the fourth cartel and probably one of the largest cartels today, if not the largest. A lot of the coke going into Ecuador is FARC cocaine. That's why Colombians had to go in there and nail uh, Raul Reyes that was hanging out in, in Ecuador. The FARC has a tremendous amount of cocaine. So number two big ones. Um you're the first person I've ever spoken to that actually met Pablo Escobar. I know you didn't spend a lot of time with him. How did you find him? I was, um, we had just airdropped in Tucson, Arizona, and some kilos hit some cactuses, and, and there was thorns in the kilos when they got delivered to L.A. So uh, I was working with Pablo Correa, who was Pablo Escobar's one of main partners back then. And I was at his farm, and... You know, I went to talk to him because he said, you know, I hope this doesn't happen again. And he showed me one of the kilos that had been airdropped. They had sent it back to him. And uh, we got thorns in the kilos. You know, this, is, uh, this isn't good for business here. And I said, I understand, you know, we're, you know, we're not airdropping in that area anymore. And, you know, this won't happen again, obviously. And while I was there, Pablo came in with his entourage of people. He was there to see Pablo on some other business, but also they, you know, Pablo showed him the kilo with the thorns. And, uh, you know, I shook his hand. He said, hi, very cordial person. Uh, he spoke, went in, into the office, spoke to Pablo, and then he came out and said, you know, 
uh, kilos and cocaine don't mix. And, uh, you know, have a good day. Suerte. <laughs> and he left with his entourage of people. I also worked with Negro Galliano, who was also a top level associate of Pablo. So I was work I was working with exclusive back then exclusively with the Medellin cartel. Later on I worked with North Northern Valley and with Cali. I was one of the few people that worked with various cartels at the same time. That was unheard of. Lewis, yeah, why is that? Is that because you were the man that didn't carry a gun, because you were the negotiator, because you were the businessman? I think a lot had to do with that. And I always kept a low profile. And uh, after the Medellin cartel, you know, fell apart, um, I did a little work with a few people in the Cali cartel. And um, then I moved directly into the Northern Valley cartel that became uh, the largest and most powerful cartel after the Medellin cartel. You got kidnapped, didn't you? More than once. Can you tell me about that? Well, the first time was, uh, you know, when I was doing a pot trip, was, which was my first and last, you know, uh, close to the uh, mountains bordering uh, Colombia with the area of Valledupar and Venezuela around there. Uh, we just walked, you know, walked into the wrong territory and the guerrillas group that was there um, grabbed me, you know, and, you know, I told them what I was doing. You know, I, I'm here to buy 35,000 pounds of pot. And this is, well, who gave you permission to come in here? He says, well, we're actually buying it from some people that these people know. And I said, well, now, you know, you're kidnapped. And they were asking like for $2 million. And I said, listen, why kidnap me for $2 million? Let's be partners. We can make $2 million a month. I said, hey, that sounds good. So I'll buy the 35,000 pounds from you. And I said, wow, that's not a bad idea. We became friends with this comandante. And when I went back to Santa Marta, these guys that I was supposed to buy them from them, they, got, they were a little pissed. I said, you know what? Take it up with El Comandante. You know, and it, that's that that was the end of that. Nobody wanted to take it up with him. And, um, you know, that trip was lost. But I paid the guy. That sort of sums a bit of you up, doesn't it, Lewis? You are an entrepreneur. Even when you've got a gun aimed at you, you can cut a deal, right? Yes. Yes, that is true. And the second time I got kidnapped was over some rumor that was spread about me, um, you know, saying the wrong thing about the person I worked with in, in back in Colombia. And it got back to him and he, you know, he sent for me. But when they send for you, it's better, don't wait for, for them to come pick you up. It's better for you to go and show up. Because in Spanish, there's a saying that says, La cara del ángel hace el milagro. The angel's face makes the miracle. So you show up. And I showed up and I was held for 21 days. Thing is that most cases when there's this kind of discrepancy and you're held, what you wish for is a quick death, that they don't torture you. If they find out you did the wrong thing, you, that you did steal, that you did talk bad about them, that you, you, you did do something wrong, they will fuck you up. They will torture you, and depending on the gravity of what you did, of course. There is like a, a sliding scale as to how much pain you will feel before you die, depending on the gravity of the offense. Yeah. If, if, they, if they feel really insulted, and it uh, depends what crazy ties you up, too. You know, some, some guys, some of these people are crazier than others. In my case... You know, there was a discrepancy about money, or they said there was, and there was rumors that I had said certain things about this person. And then they looked into all this, and they found out it, it was not true. At the end of 21 days, I was let go. But you're at a farm, and you know that that phone could ring at any time, and it's that phone call that says, kill him. That psychologically takes a toll on you. All right. Uh, when my wife 
towards the end, I didn't know all this was going on, but you know, my wife uh, went and spoke to them and offered them her jewels or paintings and everything and says, we don't want anything from you. It's with Lewis. And, uh, but she went there and uh, spoke to these people and um, begged for my life also. She said, please, you know, don't kill him. You know, all these rumors are not true. They called her back and they said, you're right. It's not true. So we're going to let him go. And, um, you know, they really liked my wife. They really res highly respect her. She's the real hero of this whole story. She really is. And, and you managed to stay together for a long time, right? For a while. And later on, we separated, but we are still very good friends. And in my book, she's the greatest woman that's walked this planet. And she's the real hero, like I said. And the other time I was in Mexico and, you know, I was in Cancun and I had a load in Belize and I was in Cancun because I was going to hand it over to the uh, local person run, running the Cancun for the Juarez cartel for Amado Carrillo. And I got to Cancun and I couldn't find this person. So I went to a hotel that I knew that they owned and I ran into his local transporter, the guy that used to pick up the merchandise and the big gasoline trucks and transport it to Houston. And I ran into him. I said, hey, I'm, I'm glad I ran into you because I got 800 kilos down in Belize and uh, I'm looking to move them up, up here. So I'm glad I ran into you. Oh, fantastic. Have you spoken to uh, you know, Metro? I go, no, I, I've been looking for him. I haven't found him. So we started playing pool, drinking, boom, boom. I lost $250,000 that night playing pool. You lost how much? Uh, $250,000. $250,000. $250, yeah, on one game. A quarter of a million game. dollars. Yeah, I said, listen, let's play for 250. I got the 800 kilos in Belize. If you win, take 50 kilos. They're yours. If I win, give me a $250,000 break on the transport. So I said, you're on. Boom, we lost like nothing. And I went back to the hotel. Next morning, I wake up to play tennis. And I'm on a phone. On a, on, I finished my tennis game. I'm on a pay phone. And suddenly, they yanked me from behind, pulled my hair, hit me with an AK-47, tried to put me in a, in a uh, Tahoe, you know, a Chevy Tahoe, you know, uh, SUV type. And it was Metro with his guys. And I was going, what the fuck? I don't know. You're working here. You didn't tell me anything. You're under the radar. You're trying to sneak a trip, you know, through me. This is my territory. Nobody works here. But what do you look? I was here last night trying to look for you. I couldn't find you. I found heat. I, I, I got drunk with heat. We played pool. Lost $250,000. That. That's the most, that's craziest story. Boom. I'm feeding you to the alligators. This is a guy called Metro. <laughs> Very volatile, violent history guy. But he's a man that likes to watch people being fed to alligators. I guess so. Thank God I never experienced it. It, it, it got close. How close? How close? I would say about three, four, four minutes five minutes away from that close because i struggled for a while because i knew if they if they stick me inside this car that's it i'm gone finally you know i flipped backwards i didn't die and then finally i said okay let's settle down let's settle down i'll go in the car i'll go in the car but you know after this please let me ride in the front seat with you because i need to talk to you i said oh my god here we are taking you Next thing you're gonna ask me to drive the car. I go, no, I just wanna sit in the front seat. I need some fresh air and I need to talk to you. So I go, okay, but we're, gonna, we're going to the alligators. I said, listen, it is what it is, but let me talk to you. So I was talking to telling him, listen, I was with he last night. I'm not here under the radar. That merchandise is for you. I lost $250,000 with him. Let's call him, let's call him. So I started dialing him and he must've been hung over and he wouldn't answer, wouldn't answer. I go, oh my God, and we're on our way to this uh, abandoned theme park, Mexican theme park that was on a, la on a lagoon and they had those alligators back there. I go, so finally I said, you know what? You call him from your phone. He'll, maybe he'll answer you. So he did. 
And he calls him and he says, aquí tengo al colocho y me lo voy a llevar donde los cocodrilos. Y, and telling him in Spanish, I've got the colocho. Colocho means Colombian. And I'm taking him to the crocodiles. I go, what are you talking about? He must have said, on, he, he must have been hung over. I said, yeah, el colocho, the guy that says that he lost $250,000. Oh, yeah, it is true, yeah. No, 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 don't feed him to the alligators. He owes me two fifty. And Metro looks at me and goes, <laughs> It's like you look at a person, there's this bond immediate. Like he looked at me and said, This mother, once again, this motherfucker's crazier than I am. And he looked at me, I said, I can't believe that fucking story's true. I said, Metro, you know me, you know, you've heard of me, you know, I don't lie. You know, I, they know they knew that I've been in this business years and years and years and years. They know I worked in Cancun before. And when he came in, I left Cancun because. You know, um, I never worked on, we weren't working with his group. So at least he knew that. So when he saw me there, he thought I was working under the radar. But when I told him that, and it was true, he looked at me and I looked at him. And then from then on, there was a bond created. The same way he can walk into a restaurant, he looks at you and you look at him the wrong way. He'll put a bullet in your head. These people are like that. So from then on, I had free reign of Cancun. Sometimes there was 30, 40,000 kilos backlogged in Cancun. My trip would come in and I would go to the front of the line. Yeah, so I was scared when I got back home, back to the hotel we were staying at. My wife was seven months pregnant. The first time I got kidnapped, my wife was seven months pregnant with my daughter. This time she was seven months pregnant with my son. And... Um, I looked like shit when I walked in the room. I mean, they had pulled my hair. I was all bent out of shape. She looked at me and said, man, that must have been one hell of a rough tennis game, I guess. I guess it was. And then, no, we went to dinner. And that night we went to dinner and we at the hotel. Suddenly they started sending champagne to the table and it was all compliments of uh, Metro. But that's a hell of a pressure, Lewis, to live under for 25 years. The fear of being caught the fear of being fed to crocodiles, the fear of having bits of your body slowly cut off you, being skinned and hung up, up upside down, all the dreadful things that we know that the cartels can do. I mean, how much damage do you think that's had on you psychologically? Mm, I mean, it has to have had some, but I, I can't say it changed me totally. I mean, normally you go through something like that and you, and you leave the business, you quit. To me, it was just, you know, part of a day's work, you know, some days are harder than others, but I continued working. Knowing that, yeah, knowing that these people that, yeah, you could die any minute, but I always thought, listen, I'm doing the right thing. And uh, I never thought about the gravity of it. And I just continued working. It was my business. That's what I was involved in. And that's what I chose to do. And that's what I liked doing. Can I just go back to the earlier days? Go back to that Miami Vice type time. Um, so many young people now won't understand what I'm talking about. But, you know, we're talking Saturday night fever, aren't we? We're open neck shirts where people driving in Ferraris and Porsches. Uh, cocaine is very pure. It's pretty uncut. What was the vibe like in Miami then? It was nightclubs. What was it like? It's crazy. Yeah, it was, you know, nightclubs, uh, red jeans, uh, you know, the escaramouche, uh, the mutiny, you know, uh, faces, cats, all these great clubs. You know, um, you know, I had three or four cars. I had a Jaguar. I had a Porsche. I had a Ferrari. I had a Bentley. I had an apartment in Grove Isle. I had another apartment up in Palm Beach. I had an apartment in Turnberry. It depends where I wanted to hang out and go party that weekend. That's the apartment I would stay in. And, um, you know, just beautiful girls. Beautiful. It was just fantastic, crazy. I mean, uh, what a lifestyle. Money was like, money was things that just came in bundles. You know, a couple bundles here, a couple bundles there. There was no sense of, you know, uh, you know, the worth of money. Now, I know what money's worth. Now, 
you know, $50,000 is a lot of money. You know, six million is amazingly, and, and, and we just, you, I don't know. We went through money like crazy. Do you have any, here's the thing for you. Do you know how much money you spent in the time that when you were, in, when you were young and you were first getting into the business? I don't know. You know, tens of millions, definitely, definitely. Just a lot of money. What was the largest sum of money you ever made on one deal? Ten, twelve million dollars. I would say, you know, maybe fifteen, but you know, anywhere around that area, around there. What did you do with it? What did you do with it? Well, it didn't all go to me. I had partners, but uh, you know, um, you know, it was a good chunk of money. You know, maybe if I if I kept five or six or seven because I owned the airplane. Sometimes we'd go. We'd airdrop in the Bahamas, come back, pick up, and go straight and drop a load into Mexico. Or we'd do four, two, two trips one night. Uh, we'd hit that lighthouse, you know, six times in three days. Um, the monies that were made in the freighter business, that was amazing because we'd take five, 6,000 kilos at a shot. You know, you, you charge you know, a thousand five hundred, two thousand dollars a kilo, that's ten million bucks, you know. Eventually you came to the attention um of Mr. Harley. Yeah? <laughs> yes. You talked me through your arrest. What happened? Um I was I was living in Milano. I was living in Milano and in Greece and I never really wanted to come back. I never wanted to cross the Atlantic again. I wanted to stay on that side. I knew I was under indictment and I felt safer in Europe. But then the office I was working with, the group I was working with had a, a big operation in Venezuela. So we were buying two or three new ships and they wanted me to come to Venezuela and have a meeting and explain the ships and so on and so forth that we were looking into. Can I ask a question, sir? Sorry, was this, was this during Chavez's time or pre-Chavez? Yes. He had just gotten into power. And, and there's always been big rumors that he was a heavy narco trafficker and was involved in it. Is that true? Not as much as the people. He, he probably was, but the people that came after him definitely, definitely are involved and created one of the biggest cartels, Cartel de los Soles. Venezuela is a narco dictatorship. Gosh, you won't get me saying that. Chavez is a true leader of the people and he had his ideas and I'm not saying, you know, he was good or bad. You know, I think he was a nut and I think uh, it was the worst thing to happen to Venezuela. But uh, the people that came after him, Maduro and uh, the, his cronies, they run Cartel de los Soles. I mean, they are hitting uh, Europe, Africa. Central America every day, thousands of kilos, huge. I mean, uh, uh, most of the money coming into Venezuela is narco money. Uh, yeah, this is something that I've heard. They actually use military aircraft to transport. Military is totally, totally involved. Military is totally involved. Totally. And uh, the U.S. knows it, of course, because they've arrested a lot of people. And I have friends that work that I've worked with the, the military and the cocaine business. And I have all, other people that have infiltrated, you know, these groups and they're all working with the military. So that's, that's a fact. So going back to you, you're in Europe, you're safe, but you, you're having to travel to Venezuela. I wasn't too happy about it. And um, I traveled as a Mexican. The group in Venezuela was already infiltrated by this joint international task force out of Houston. So the, the infiltrated guy, the guy that was infiltrated, informed uh, law enforcement that there was, the Greek was coming because they knew there was a Greek and they called me the Greek because I was working with the Greek, with the Greeks, with the shipping companies out of Fideos and so on and so forth. So they're waiting for a Greek, but you know, I show up and they find out that I'm a Mexican. I go, Mexican? They were trying to figure out who the hell I was, this and that. 
and they couldn't figure it out. So they took the fingerprints off, off a glass and pop, it pops back. It's Louis Navia. So they have to, by protocol, inform Bob Hardy, who's got my initial indictment from the Florida Keys. And Bob had already been after me for years, tried to catch me in Cancun, and I slipped out of Cancun, uh, tried to catch me in Mexico City, tried to catch me in Panama, and uh, all this time I slipped away. So this time he says, grab them. I says, they didn't want to. They wanted to give me a little more rope to see wh where all this was going. But he said, grab me. And that's um, when I was tipped off by the taxi driver leaving the Tamanaco that, you know, he had been pulled over the night before and questioned about me being a nar narco trafficking. And, um, you know, the order was given for, to arrest me. And then, you know, sure enough, when this guy tips me off, I don't go back to the hotel and I tell my girlfriend, get out of there. We need to leave. That's when we left to the airport early in the morning. We took a flight to Maracaibo and I thought we had lost them, but they were already tracking us big time. And uh, a few days later, they mobilized, you know, our army personnel into Maracaibo. They had like eight helicopters and they had flown in, you know, a hundred guys for this operation to, to capture me and Yvonne in Maracaibo. And I was at a barber shop and they walked in and they arrested me. And then they put us on these helicopters, military helicopters, took us back to Caracas. And that's when I saw all the merchandise coming in. We had 25,000 kilos that were scheduled to be shipped to Europe. This was Guardia Nacional from Venezuela, DEA, British uh, law enforcement, um, customs. It was a joint international task force and it's called Operation Journey. And they were onto it. We had the merchandise in the Orinoco River Delta, which is like in the middle of nowhere. And um, we used to airdrop the merchandise there, store it, and then take it out in, in small, you know, uh, go fasts to the ships that would come into Puerto Ordaz, pick up steel or aluminum or whatever. And when they went out into the Atlantic, we would hit them with the merchandise and then they would go into Europe. So we weren't re really working with the government. It's not like we paid off Chavez or nothing. No, 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 no. I was more in interested in the fact that the Venezuelan government was prepared to work with the Americans and others in order to, to, to arrest you. Yes, of course. They never told the Venezuelans who they had. The DEA, uh, when I took, they took a picture of me, uh, they put uh, Novoa. They didn't put my real last name. I was under a fake passport and they used that. Boom. They didn't use my last name. And, um, but they were working. They were, the, the relationship was still there and they were working together. Later on, that all, you know, went down the tubes. There's no DEA presence in Venezuela anymore. Um, how do you end up in prison in, then in America? How does that happen for being arrested in, in Caracas? Well, they never arrested Luis Navia. So they put me on a, they flew in a C-130 and the U.S. Marshals came and took me because I was wanted in the U.S. under the Harley indictment, under the Florida Keys indictment. They flew me into the U.S., into Fort Lauderdale, uh, Hollywood International Airport. And that was it. After that, uh, they took me to um, FDC, the federal you know, building here in Miami. And I spent uh, 13, 14 months there while they sentenced me. And then I went off to prison to Central Florida. What was the sentence? The original sentence was 11 years. They charged me with uh, the 4,900 kilos indictment from the Florida Keys. There was a, an indictment out of the Florida Keys for 4,900 kilos, and they charged me with that. I forgot, 4,600 or 4,900. Um, that's what they charged me with, and my sentence was 11 years. 
um, there were people in the system already that were willing to testify against me. And I had very, very little chance of winning a case. You know, the, once you're indicted and you have a federal case, you know, 97%, and that is a true fact, you lose. And if you fight your case and you lose, you're going to get rammed with. And I was looking at life. So my attorney says, listen, they got merchandise. So they seized real merchandise. This is not a conspiracy case. There's more than 10 people in the system that are willing to testify against you. You're going to get crucified. That's when, you know, I asked my wife to go to Colombia and talk to the people I worked with down there and told them, listen, if I'm going to get hurt or my wife is going to get hurt, you know, I'm stuck. I'll do 35 years. Yeah, that's, that's the way the cards played. But I want guarantees that my wife isn't going to get hurt and uh, no repercussions. They told her, listen, he worked with us for many, many years, made us a lot of money. We're all in hot water. We're all dead in the water, you know. Um, tell him to do the best he can to get out as soon as he can. And uh, he's not going to tell them anything that they don't already know. And um, my wife told me that, and I felt secure, so I debriefed. Now, the big leaders of the Colombian cartels were already on a path of cooperation with the DEA. Back in 1998, they had meetings in Panama, the major cartel leaders with the DEA, um, to open up negotiations into some kind of system to lower their, their sentences or, you know, avoid getting um, more indictments. So this was a, a big case and uh, millions of dollars were exchanged. It became a scandal. But, you know, the major cartel leaders already wanted to open the doors to lighten their sentence and into cooperation. They established that. When you say millions of dollars were exchanged, what, what, what can you allude to exactly what you, what do you mean by that? Well, this is the, you can look it up in Google. This is the Baruch Vega case where he was the intermediary between the US government, DEA, and the Colombian cartel leaders. And they say that over a hundred and over, uh, I've heard figures of $114 million. Um, this is a Colombian business. Colombians run the show. They set the pace. So in 98, when they started looking into cooperating with the DEA to lessen their sentences and to see which possibilities existed of not getting brought into the U.S., so on and so forth, this was already, this um, um, air of cooperation was already established. So now that's why most Colombians that get arrested, paramilitary leaders, high profile cartel leaders, they end up getting 14, 15, 17 years and they do eight and they're back home. That's, that's a fact. That's called your rule 35, which is a reduction of sent, uh, a reduction after sentencing, reduction of time after sentencing. And did you get that? Yes, I got that for my debriefing most most of my debriefing was historical but it was uh, since i was involved for 25 years it gave him a very very good picture of what you know of the, the history of this whole thing from from the late 70s so and uh bob harley you know bob harley could have nailed me to the wall because the key in my situation was leadership when they give you leadership role, you got to, you know, it adds six, seven, eight years to your sentence. And um, they, it just, it turned, turned out that uh, on that 91 indictment, you know, I, I told Bob, you know, I was not the leader on that indictment. So he took away leadership role. And um, that's part of the reason I got 11 years and, and not more. Leadership is a bad thing to get. And, I, and it was true. On that, one, on that 1991 indictment, my partner was the leader on that indictment, not me. And since they brought me on that indictment, 
you know, that's what I had to focus on. But that took a lot of thinking, a lot of sleepless nights. I was very worried. I was looking at life. Is there a Pablo Escobar out there now that no one knows about? Are those days gone? Not his style, but there's a lot of huge, huge players out there that nobody knows about. Huge, huge. And these people have partnered up with the Mexicans, so it makes the numbers even bigger. Because now the loads, you know, 10,000, 20,000. You have Mexican investment money in the picture now that just makes the amount of cocaine being produced astronomical. It's a business. And any business grows with capital infusion. So right now, you, got, you know, Mexicans are making billions. What do they do with those billions? They send it down to Colombia to more cocaine and more cocaine and more cocaine. So it's out of control. Um, the one thing that really struck me when I was in Juarez, and this was when there was at least four people being killed every hour while I was there. It was like, it was like a war zone. It was like being in Afghanistan. Um, there was, on the other side of the border, on, on the US side, before you even went into El Paso, you had to go for an army checkpoint. When you got there, there was state troopers, state police, there was the city police, the El Paso police, there was ICE immigration services, there was FBI, there was CIA, there was DEA, there was firearms, alcohol, tobacco, and explosives. So you had state, national, federal police forces. You had every kind of police force you ever want. Plus you had border force, right? Didn't stop the guns going south or the drugs going north. No. So what, what really is the point of the war on drugs? if it has failed so spectacularly. You know, what's the definition of a madman? One that continues to make the same mistake over and over again. So this is total madness to continue running this war on drug the way they're doing it. The, the, the drug business has only grown exponentially. It's, it's huge. This war on drug has been a complete failure. But then again, you know, you've got the DEA, you've got this, and they don't know any better. They, they, they have no idea. It's just going to get bigger and bigger. It's a failed process. What's the answer? If the war on drugs is a failure, what is the solution? Take the word war out of it and legalize this stuff. It's going to, as a business, a monetarily and economically, it'll reach a balance, a price point. Um, you're gonna be able to control it. You wanna keep your enemies close. You can control it. You, the illegal product has to be as good as the legal product. So you're gonna, people will be able to buy pure cocaine if they wanna buy cocaine, pay a premium, tax dollars, and nobody's gonna be putting, nobody's gonna buy anything with fentanyl and, and that kind of stuff. So in all sense, you start controlling it and you start diminishing the chaos. Right now it's total chaos from A to Z. So you legalize it, it's like liquor. You go to the liquor store and you buy good liquor. Do you buy liquor from anybody that makes it in his bathtub? No. And liquor is terrible. Liquor is real bad. And once you can buy it, yeah, people who, you know, this whole thing about, you know, I think the consumption will even go down. Also, this is a medical problem. A person that's an addict should not be put in a position of criminality to be able to support his habit. Yes, it's bad, but he's an addict. He should be able to get health services to alleviate his problem. And if he does need the drug, let him get it legally and let him get some, you know, psychological support also. And you tax the hell out of it and you make billions of dollars. You improve health care. You improve education. You know, look at the amount of money that's made from the taxing of cigarettes and, and liquor. 
you know, something, tell me something that's worse than cigarettes. Cigarettes is probably the worst thing in the world. It's killed more people than cocaine. You know, fighting it like well, the way we're doing, it's putting more product on the street, more product with fentanyl. So you start controlling it and lowering this chaotic craziness we're in. Let's be clear to people who don't know, fentanyl is a synthetic form of heroin, which is 50 times stronger than, than heroin. Yep. Potentially lethal. And if you mix it in with coke and you get the mix wrong, you're going to kill people. Exactly. And they're doing that. So if somebody's going to consume, you know, protect your people, protect your citizens, uh, give them health care. An addict is not a bad person. He's, it's an unfortunate human being that's caught up in a really screwed up situation and his life is going down the drain. Help him get out of that. Uh, don't put him in a situation of criminality where he has to go and risk his life just to get a fix. Portugal just uh, legalized it. That, that's the trend. That's the civilized way to deal with things. You know, you know, be intelligent about it. This war on drugs is like the dumbest. They, they, you know, listen, I know great DEA agents and they're great friends and it's not their fault, but it's just the system has proven to be faulty. Lewis, you think it's also because the system in its way generates its own money? I mean, you know, to have all those different federal organizations all with their own leaders, with their own lieutenants, with their own soldiers on the ground, their own little fiefdoms, as it were. They want their budgets, they want their money. So in a way, it's self-fulfilling. You know, we have a war on drugs. I have a budget. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Or I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And, and consequently, you know, more, more, more M4 carbines are, are, are made, more 4x4 four four, uh, Jeeps are made. You know, more bullets are made. Yeah, it, it's a business and it's uh, different sides of the same coin. But, you know, DEA agents don't want to legalize this. A lot of them may lose their jobs. But these jobs are not curing the problem. So they have jobs and their job description is, you know, uh, try to eliminate the drug problem and they're not doing it. They haven't done it. It's not their fault. It's just the system, but it's all money. And uh, the DEA, you know, they have their agents, they make good money and it's just business. It's just different side of the same coin. The drug cartels are making a lot of money and these agencies are making a lot of money. It's time to change it around a bit. And maybe some of these people stay employed, but working in a different capacity with a different mentality, with a different purpose. Lewis, I have to talk to you 25 years working with the cartels, number of years in prison. What's the biggest regret? Well, obviously, being so reckless with my money and not getting out in time. Okay, I, I was handed a golden opportunity at a time in my life that by the time I was 27 years old, I already had $7 million. Whether it's good, bad, whatever it is, reality is at 27, I had $7 million. I should have gotten out. Bought in a Ford dealership. <laughs> you know, what the hell? And I just continued and continued because I'm a romantic, you know, and it was... To me, it was just an amazing business. It was just a rush. And I loved the allure of, you know, doing something different and something. It was a rush. And you got to stop and, you know, eliminate the rush factor and click in the reality factor. You know, I thought I was never going to get caught and I was never going to die. And I was just going to create this tremendous empire and i need i never needed banks because i was my own bank and i was always in legal businesses you know i had sugar interests i had sugar packing operations i had coffee business and um i was just um you know living an illusion 
I uh, should have been less of a romantic and an adventurer and, you know, settle down. But then again, that's not me. I'm not the settling down type. I had the most beautiful, amazing woman in the world with two beautiful kids. And I had them and I took them for granted. I should have gotten out at least if I didn't get out when I was 27, I should have gotten out when my kids were born. And that's my biggest regret because you know, look what I'm doing now. It does, you know, I'm the kind of guy that I could do that and I can also do other things. I'm not limited to just criminal activities. And that's, that's sad. And, and I am guilty of that. Um, Chop was less guilty than I am. He was born very poor. He had no other alternative in life because he was very limited to his opportunities. I went to Georgetown University. But then I met a beautiful girl. And so, you know, I got into it, but I should have been smart enough or more mature to get out of it. I didn't. Can I just say, Luis Navia, pure narco, you are an interesting man, sir. You'll have, you've got stories, stories for the, by the fireside more than most. And I think if you'd opened a Ford sales shop, you wouldn't have those stories, that's for sure. Whatever, I could have opened up a franchise, but you're right. Uh, we wouldn't be here having this conversation, and this is a great conversation we've had. I've really enjoyed it. The pleasure talking to you. Absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs>